is a handout. Uh, we're going to try to do a handout. I'm, I'm not promising I'll get one done every Wednesday, but for tonight there is a handout. Uh, the Prayer Workshop is the title of this series of studies. It's devoted to the study of prayer, and it's going to take us through the end of February with one break, and that's for the annual meeting coming up on January 25th. Uh, and so we've got the outline there at the top of the page. Uh, and then um, you also have uh, tonight's study, which is prayer and praise to God. And so uh, thinking about how we express our praise to God, well, we, we do it, you know, when we sing, when we sing hymns, we do it with our lifestyle by honoring the Lord. But one of the chief ways that we express our praise and thanksgiving to God is by means of our uh, prayer. Uh, so we, we pray and we tell God that we love him and we ex extol him, we, we praise his name and so on. So we're gonna quickly look at three passages tonight uh, and highlight especially this aspect of praising God and thanking him, calling attention to who he is and what he does. So I'm in 1 Samuel chapter two and let me read for you Hannah's song. And uh, if you, as we read through this together, you might be reminded of another woman who had a praise song, and that would be because she copied, to a large extent, from Hannah. Hannah's the original, and Mary uh, actually followed in her footsteps. So here in, in 1 Samuel 2, I'll read for us uh, her song in the first 10 verses. Then Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. There's actually quite a bit of uh, theology, a lot of doctrine in H Hannah's song here. And she's praying, this is a prayer that she's praying to the Lord. So what characteristics of the Lord uh, does, does Hannah point out in her prayer to God? Notice in verse two, let's start in verse two. What do you see there? No one holy like the Lord. So the concept of holiness, God is pure. He is set apart. He is distinct from everything and everybody else. There is no one like him. Hannah knows that, and she, she uh, focuses on that. Uh, God, you are holy. You are distinct from sin. You are distinct from all of your creation. What else do you see in, in verse 2? He's a rock. He's a rock. So what picture do you get in your mind when you hear that word rock? Strength. Strength, stability. It doesn't move. It doesn't waver. It doesn't change its mind. And so God is our rock. And you might even ponder for a moment. Uh, that image shows up a lot, uh, you know, a, a while after Hannah gives birth to Samuel in David's Psalms. So the Psalms use a lot of that imagery. Uh, God is our rock. Uh, what else do you see, say, in verse 3? A God of knowledge. A God of knowledge. In, in, the, in the context, look at the next line. And with him, actions are weighed. 
What is Hannah getting at? God knows everything. He knows people's motivations. He sees what people do in the dark. And, of course, she herself has come through a real rugged time. Uh, you know, her, her, uh, Elkanah's other wife, uh, Penina, was real hard on her, uh, razzing her and teasing her because she, Penina, had children, and uh, <coughs> Hannah was barren for a, quite a long time. So a lot of this is confrontational and even military. You kind of pick up on that, the way that Hannah phrases things about God. Uh, so God knows the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. Uh, can we apply that to ourselves even today? Actions are weighed. What would we do with that in 2023? Certainly God knows me, and he's watching me, and so I'm accountable. Good. What else in the broader culture? Certainly. Evangelism, telling other people about Christ. And also, when we look at the culture and how wicked it has become, how backward politicians are, and we get discouraged, we say, can this ever get fixed? Well, guess what? It may not get fixed in this lifetime, but God will fix it because he is a God who weighs actions. The Lord is a God of knowledge. He knows everything. And there is accountability. A lot of this is about God will hold accountable people who have done wrong. That's our hope, isn't it? God, God will make things right somehow. If we were to try to do it, what a mess we would make. But God will make all wrongs right somehow in the end. Uh, there's kind of a theme running through 5 and 6, 7, 8. Did you pick up on that? the poor, the lowly, those that, those that sit on the ash heap. God has a habit of taking people like that and doing what? Elevating. So David was a shepherd boy. And uh, over and over again, you find the little guy is the one that God promotes. Uh, Gideon, you know, and so many of the judges and, and many, many other people in the Bible were the least, the smallest, and then God elevates them and says, okay, I'm going to do something big with you. And so God, uh, God takes those who are lowly, those who are poor, and he elevates them and brings them up to a high spot. Uh, notice also at the end of verse 8, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. What does Hannah mean by that? Yeah, so God created the world, and he made it, and then he sets the world on it as if it's four legs of a table, and it, the implication is God is the creator, God is a sustainer, God is sovereign, he rules, he's in charge. Uh, and then finally, in verses 9 and 10, uh, what sort of characteristics and actions of the Lord do we see there in verse 9? In the first line, for example. He keeps the feet of his godly ones. What does that mean? Yeah, so God watches over us. God protects us. Uh, he uh, he, he uh, even protects us sometimes from physical harm. Um, and, uh, you know, probably most everybody in this room has been through a car wreck. Uh, well, we're all still here. God preserved us uh, even when our life was on the line. So God... Uh, keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. And here's the reason, not by might shall a man prevail. An individual who says, I'm strong, I'm wealthy, I'm powerful. No, that doesn't impress God. God has uh, other ways of evaluating. Verse 10, those who contend with the Lord will be shattered, uh, but the Lord himself will judge the ends of the earth. He'll give strength to his king. So what are some general themes that you see in Hannah's praise to the Lord in her prayer? God is great. He is sovereign. He rules. He reigns. He's in charge. God is gracious and compassionate to the lowly. 
Those who turn to him, he will guard and keep and, and protect. And so these are themes that Hannah is emphasizing. Let's go over to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And here is a Psalm of David. And we could obviously take hours and hours and hours going through the book of Psalms because the Psalms is just full of this concept of praising God, of thanking God, and, and we would be here hours and hours and hours, but we're just going to select one, Psalm 103, and I'm going to read the first 14 verses. This is one of David's Psalms, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, he is mindful that we are but dust. And there's more, but we'll pause there. So what characteristics of the Lord do you see David emphasizing and praising here? What characters, what uh, attitudes or personality traits do you see in the Lord and, and David's praise? Forgiveness, mercy, his mercy. He holds back when he has every right to punish and he's, he's gracious and light-handed. What else do you see? He's a healer. So he looks down upon us and he sees that we're beat up and sore and bruised and hurting. And he, he heals us spiritually and physically. What else? Patient. Uh, so there's references made here to uh, the, the children of Israel. And, you know, whenever you think of God's interactions with Israel, you think, wow, they were so rebellious, so hard-hearted for not just 40 years in the wilderness, but for generations. And God continued to be patient with them. And we're so grateful that he was patient to them because it means he's patient with us too. Yeah, what else? No other love like that unbelievable love, incredible grace from God. Look at verse 6, talking not just about what he is, but what he does. So his actions. What do you see in verse 6 about God's actions? Righteous, righteous deeds. So whatever God does is always right. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say every action I've ever taken was the right one. <laughs> Don't I wish. <laughs> it's not like that at all. But with the Lord, all his, all his deeds are exactly right. They're never immoral. They're never done out of wrong motives. They're never shading anything. They're always exactly right. What else? His actions, his activities. Yes. So the picture is of taking our, a bundle of sin, a bundle of bad things, and taking them far, far away. And they, they're no longer relevant. They, they no longer count against us. Uh, I have thought so many times in my life, if God were to deal with me right now like I deserve, it'd just be, you know, a lightning bolt, a little puff of greasy smoke and that's it that's what I deserve 
at any given moment. But he's slow to anger. Praise the Lord. What else? Compassionate. Compassionate. So he looks at us and he feels, do you remember Jesus watching the multitudes? And he says, I feel like, like these people are sheep without a shepherd. They don't know what they're doing. They're so leaderless. They're so rudderless. They don't have any direction in life. They don't have any, any uh, moral compass. They got nothing. And God is so compassionate. He, he looks down on us and he feels sorry for us. Huh. What else? Yes. Yes. He doesn't hold us immediately accountable. He takes them away. He sends them away. God is very, very forgiving. In, uh, in verse uh, 13, what is he like? A father. A father having compassion on his little children. And they mess up and they get in trouble, but he doesn't go out with a big club and beat them. He, he, he's sorry for them. He's compassionate. In verse 14, David explains why. Why is he so compassionate and light-handed and merciful? He knows that if he were to lean on us too hard, we would just crumble. Physically, mentally, spiritually, God is so big, God is so huge, that if he were to just lay his hand on us a little too hard, we'd, we're vaporized. He knows that. He knows that our frame, and, and David here is referring to our, our skeleton, our body, but behind that, it's all that makes us up, our, our psyche, our spiritual nature as well as our bodily nature. God knows that we're actually very fragile creatures. We're very delicate, and he can't put too much weight on us. And for that reason, he's gentle. He's compassionate. He's kind. Very, very interesting. What else? Do you see anything else there in David's remarks, David's praise to the Lord? So let's go to the New Testament. Go to Acts chapter 4, please. We're moving into the church age now. We've seen a couple of Old Testament examples of people who are praying to the Lord, but their prayer consists nearly entirely of not asking God for things, but instead praising God and acknowledging God's character and his deeds. So here's another one. And, and the apostles, uh, Peter and John, have met with the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin uh, threatened them and said, uh, you can't talk anymore in this name, referring to Jesus. You, you've got to stop this. And... Uh, Peter and John said, well, we're going to obey God. They went back to the meeting place and reported to the church family all that had happened. And they decide to have a prayer meeting. They're going to pray together. So this is after having been threatened by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. And now the church family is together and they're going to pray. And they are going to ask for boldness. But observe how they begin their prayer. So I'm in Acts chapter 4, Acts 4. Please look at verse 24. Acts 4, 24. Uh, and when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage? and the peoples devise futile things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, Take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So their specific prayer request is found in verse 29, for boldness uh, that God would grant to them confidence as they continue to do what the San, Sanhedrin had told them not to do, that is to preach the truth. But I want to call your attention especially to the opening of their prayer when the apostles are leading the church in prayer and everybody's together and they begin in, uh, in verse uh, 24 and they say, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So uh, what demonstration of God's power and sovereignty does the church acknowledge here in verse 24 in its prayer uh, at, uh, corporately? The creation and the sustaining power of God. Uh, this, by the way, is, is fully in keeping with the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament of using the creation as one of the great markers of God's sovereignty. And it goes right on into the, into the New Testament. So one of the reasons that we call attention to God's greatness and majesty to his sovereignty and his power is we say, well, God, you made everything. The heavens and the earth, the sea, the sky, the angels, the animals, the, 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 phys the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, everything that, that we see, you made it all, and so you are sovereign, you are Lord. They're acknowledging that. And then they actually go on in verses 25 and, and 26 and 27 to note another intervention of God or demonstration of God's power do you see what it is there? Verse 25, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So what's the second? Not just the creation and the sovereignty of God there, but what else? So the person and work of Christ, specifically the crucifixion and the resurrection are referenced here. And that too is a demonstration that God is great, that God is in charge, that God rules, that God does what he wants. He sets up a program, he sets a plan, and then he carries it out. Observe there, in verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And so God planned this, even though the, the, the nations and Israel and the Roman authorities were gathered together against Christ. Nonetheless, God carried out his program. God did what he planned to do. Uh, so there is specific prayer request in uh, verse 29 not 28, but 29, is, uh, Lord, take note of their threats. Grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. So that's their prayer request, but it begins with calling attention to the Lord as sovereign, majestic, powerful, great, and as we've seen in the Old Testament, compassionate, merciful, gentle. It's all praising God. It's all worshiping the Lord at the beginning of this prayer, and really for most of the other two that we looked at, Psalm 103 and 1 Samuel chapter 2. So where we're going with this study in the next weeks is we're going to talk about how prayer is a preparation for really all of life, for major decisions, minor decisions, for relationships, for, for everything. The preparation of prayer then we're going to spend a little bit of time in Matthew on the meaning of prayer, uh, what's often called the Lord's Prayer, talking about that, our annual meeting on the 25th of January, the process of prayer, what are the mechanics of it? How does it work? What, what is prayer doing when we're talking to God? And then prayer in Isaiah, the ingredients of prayer, lastly, looking at Daniel. But tonight, uh, we are going to take a couple of minutes now for prayer requests, but our assignment for tonight, for our prayer time, this, this I think will be 
challenging, but good, to take our entire prayer time. If we have, you know, 12 or 15 minutes to pray in, in groups, to take that entire time to talk to God, but not to ask him for anything. Now, we do have things to ask God for, including Lynette is in the hospital and so on, so we're going to take prayer requests. But when, get, when it comes time to pray, I'm going to challenge us. This would be a good, at the very beginning of the year, the first Wednesday night of a brand new year, how about if we just talk to God and tell him, Lord, you're great, you're sovereign, you're in charge, and we want to praise you, and we want to thank you, and we acknowledge your gentleness and your compassion. Uh, I'm not sure when was the last time I had a prayer session with the Lord that was just that and not my list of things that I need him to do for me. So I'm suggesting that tonight uh, we would spend our entire prayer time just talking to God about how wonderful he is. So before we get there, 